So, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for having me here, Dr. Datta and Dr. Ghosh. Uh, so, I think we are in online mode now, but I hope to see you next year in person uh, oh. at the WA meeting. So, I'm going to speak something on HEFPEF, what exactly is new, new happening. I don't have any disclosures or conflicts for this presentation. Uh, so, HEFPEF, uh, uh, why do we need to understand HEFPEF? Because HEFPEF is a heterogeneous disorder, it one size is not does not fit all. We see a lot of patients coming here which uh, are not fitting to the definitions of HEFPEF, and there is a lot of variability. Echo diagnosis, which is the most important of diastole dysfunction HEFPEF, many times have gray zones and can be challenging. We need to have more tests to identify this entity, and we desperately are in need of some treatment for HFPEF. So uh, the causes of diastole dysfunction and HFPEF are basically uh, very routinely seen in our OPD, coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, patients on sleep apnea or metabolic syndrome can have uh, this entity and should, should be identified and should they should have a regular echo on a periodic basis. Now, this is a, a recent data which came in 2016, understanding the structural, functional, and ultra-structural characteristic of the left ventricle, comparing in both HFPEF and HFREF. And as you can see that uh, the volumes in HFPEF are, are unchanged, while in HFREF they, uh, they have dilated LV. The wall thickness is more. Uh, we, there is a, the remodeling is mostly concentric in HFPEF, in HFREF it is eccentric. The ejection fraction is maintained, the stroke was, work is maintained, while in LV as ultrastructural changes, the myocyte diameter increases in HFPEF, where in HFREF it may be more or less normal. But the importance of identifying fibrosis by, by cardiac MR, in HFPEF, it is interstitial or reactive, while in HFREF, it is focal or replacement. So there's a lot of work which, which is being uh, going on in understanding the mechanisms. And before understanding uh, what exactly is ejection fraction, we have to understand the concept of cardiac performance. Now, a heart is basically behaves as a hydraulic pump, and we do look at the cardiac output, stroke volume, the systemic and the uh, the uh, pulmonary vascular resistance and arterial pressure. And this has been classically seen by a Swan Gans catheter in days old time, uh, which gets converted in heart into a compression perm, where we have we can identify by looking either by an LV cath or by an echo, looking at the ejection fraction, the pressure volume curves, or the, or the DP by DT. But we ha also uh, nowadays look at the tissue level, where the heart works as a tissue pump, looking at the biomarker and the molecular imaging, looking at the BNP, antibro, BNP levels, cytokine levels. And we do under know that heart also is, can be a muscular problem, looking at the contractility, the twist and the untwist mechanism, which can be picked up by the strain analysis, by either or by an echo or an MRI. So this is the concept of cardiac performance, uh, which should be remembered by everyone. And uh, this can get translated in, in, in the evolution of HFPEF. As you can see, this is a time course uh, looking at there are risk factors, comorbidities, uh, which precipitate HFPEF, a sedentary lifestyle, an unhealthy diet, obesity, metabolic syndrome, hypertension, coronary artery disease, which initiates the systemic mechanism of inflammation, oxidative stress, and endothelial dysfunction, microvascular problem, involving the cardiovascular system with a lot of remodeling, delayed relaxation, uh, uh, involvement of left atrium, dyssynchrony, involvement of the right side, uh, causing a low reserve component, uh, altering the preload and offload changes. There is chronotropic incompetence, determining the quality of life. A lot of things get, uh, get activated. And we do have a clinical syndrome where the patient has a poor quality of life, effort intolerance, pulmonary edema, recurrent admissions, and, and recurrent co comorbidities. So this is the proposed mechanism of the evolution of heart failure, and we have to identify them. And the future is, is going to hold true and important in understanding and giving the treatment in, in either of this course of heart failure treatment. Now, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction 
uh, can have a varied kind of mycard involvement. And, and, and as we as cardiologists should also know that we can have isolated cardiac involvement in hof hef classically seen in infiltrative cardiomyopathy, where the primary problem is in the heart, which causes the raised LV flake pressure. But the heart can also get involved uh, by primary involvement of other organs, like in patients who have in actually isolated renal problem, liver failure, or they are, they are obese. And this is basically an extracardic cause of HFPEF phenotype. And there is a lot of overlay and the patient can be identified in any of the spectrum. So it is very important that whenever we give a diagnosis of HFPEF, we have to, uh, to understand what is the actual mechanism because the treatment uh, is going to differ. So the HFPEF phenotypes uh, came from Sanjeev Shah's group uh, and he uh, mentioned them into three phenogroups. It's very imperative for us to identify them because of prognosticate importance. The HFPEF <coughs> phenotype one is basically a BNP deficient syndrome, which is associated with least cardiac remodeling, uh, have a BNP deficiency. So the BNP levels are less, in cardiac involvement is less. The phenotype group two uh, has a more myocardial involvement, mostly seen in diabetic patients. And the third is a phenogroup uh, three, where the involvement is of mostly associated RV, there's a renal involvement, and also uh, the, there's involvement uh, uh, association of atrial fibrillation. Now, why is it important to identify this group of patient is that the prognosis differs. So if you have involvement of the RV, AF, or renal problem, they are going to do poorer uh, as, as we uh, follow them up. And, and if you are having uh, patients who are in phenotype two, they are going to do better. Remember, if you're suspecting patient to be in HFPEF, and if you see that the BAPs are coming normal or low normal, just don't know something after. So it is important to identify these three subgroups. A very good paper from Sanjeev Shah's group and gives a lot of knowledge about the HFPEF. The BNP has caveats. 30% uh, of the patients of HFPEF can have lower normal because we have false positive results with age. Women have high BNP. Uh, uh, there is uh, BNP can be high in atrial fibrillation. Again, false negative, obesity decreases BNP. There can be rapid uh, change in BNP with pressures. So uh, it is important that we know these caveats. So the phenotype one, BNP deficiency syndrome should be uh, identified. They have a lack of LV wall stress. And this has been correlated in patients of uh, uh, in a mouse uh, where they have they developed obesity and diabetes subsequently. So this is the proposed mechanism. They are uh, genetic obese. They have lack of wall stress, high androgen levels also seen in Africans. Uh, proposed uh, predisposes to hypertension, fluid retention, high adiposity across the chest, fall and thorax, and they are predominantly HFPEF with minimal cardiac involvement, but a better prognosis. The phenotype 2 group, mostly most common group, uh, has a longitudinal systolic function involvement, more involvement of the heart. Uh, the diastolic dysfunction is pronounced, uh, worsens with increasing number of risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, and we can identify by looking at the strain analysis. The phenotype 3 group is the high, poorer prognosis, have higher RV involvement, renal insufficiency, AF, sepsis, splenic condition. So it is important to identify these three groups. Now, we do understand cardiac performance assessment, and then we have been looking at a lot of things like uh, uh, looking at the cardiac power output and everything, ejection fraction. But the, now the recent robust thing which we do look at is nothing but global uh, uh, longitudinal strain of the LV and also look at the left atrial strain in this group of patients of HFPEF. And it is an important assessment of the overall cardiac function in HFPEF group of patients because it gives a lot of information into what subclinical LV dysfunction is happening. Now, uh, can we phenotype HFPEF? The answer is yes, beyond ejection fraction. If the EF is normal, uh, just don't say that the patient is not doing normal because e, uh, global uh, longitudinal strain tells you about the, about the, uh, the heart's condition. How does it do? It is a marker of the health of the subendocardium. And as you can see, the normal cutoff is around minus 19. So if you are going towards positive, the LV uh, subendocardium is, is, has a poorer health. If it is better, you're doing well. And this information is now available in all the machines and should be done. 
So can we do phenotyping of the uh, HFPF beyond ejection fraction? So if you have heart failure, if the LV is preserved, look at the strains. So if you have a preserved strain or a reduced longitude strain, of course, in LV ejection fraction, which is normal, reduced on the strain, it is associated with infiltrative cardiomyopathy, contractile dysfunction, some evidence of myocardial fibrosis. But if the HFPF is there, but if the LV function is preserved with preserved GLS, you have to start looking at something else. That is primarily LA dysfunction. We can have abnormal VA coupling or an isolated RV dysfunction or extra cardiac volume overload. So this is the second phenotype uh, a grouping of uh, HFPF beyond the ejection fraction. Now, we do see LA uh, mechanics to be abnormal uh, in HFPF, and uh, uh, can we look at beyond the LV? Now, there is a lot of work which has come up uh, 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 in in about looking at the LA, and I I've, I see that uh, Dr. Mohan is going to speak something on the left atrial mechanics in HFPF. So I'm not going to detail. But uh, we have started looking at the LV reservoir strain, and this is a work which has come up uh, in HFPF uh, in patients who are in normal sinus rhythm or patients who have atrial fibrillation. And the cutoff which has been given is that if the strain values of LA reservoir strain values uh, is more than 31, uh, then uh, they do pretty well as compared to patients who have, who have uh, uh, strain values of less than 31. So 31 is, is the cutoff in LA strain in patients who have uh, HFPF. So LA strain is an important parameter and is a key determinant in patients who have HFPF, both in patients who are stable, and you can also exercise them and try to look at it. A second uh, subgroup of uh, phenotyping came from, from Barry Burlock's group, and he it was reported in Mayo Clinic's uh, proceedings where they have divided HFPF into non-obese and obese group. So obese are the black, as you can see. They have more edema as compared to non-obese, uh, more hospitalization in the obese group, more symptomatic in the obese group, orthopnea more over. LA enlargement, interestingly, is lesser in the obese group and also anti-pro-BNP is lesser in obese group. So this is what is also been reported by the by Dr. Sanjeev Shah's group. So. The, the Bad River Logs uh, uh, team uh, divided them only into non-obese and the obese group of things. So you have to remember looking at the BMI of this group of patients. Now, uh, uh, this has again been reported uh, more uh, by, by, the, by lit in the literature about the obese entity of FPF and non-obese. Uh, but the clinical pr perspective is that Compared to non-obese, obese have display greater volume overload, bioventricular remodeling, greater RV involvement, poorer exercise capacity, and an impaired pulmonary vessel dilatation. So this has to be noted in all group of patients. So the why it is important to subclassify the phenotypes because the treatment modality uh, should be directed. So if you have a lung condition, if you are obese or diabetic, then diuretics should be add should be given. But if you have arterial hypertension, then you have to treat the treatment of the anti with antihypertensives. And if you have coronary artery disease, you revascularize. But if there is chronotropic incompetence, you can look at, you can adapt, go for an atrial pacing. But if there is an evidence of pulmonary hypertension, a role of pulmonary vasodilators can also be quite tried. But the most important thing of all is an exercise program should always be given if there is skeletal or muscle weakness. Uh, in this group of patients. And if these patients have, have atrial fibrillation, the role of anticoagulation becomes imperative. So exercise training does improve heart failure and does improve diastolic dysfunction. A lot of work has now started coming on and it, had, it has shown that a uh, three months exercise training program in HFPF group increases and improves the quality of life in patients and they should be structured. So a baseline stress hemodynamics is needed in, in this group of patients. The last slide, can diastole dysfunction have be prevented? We don't know the answer, but I think uh, an important article showed that, yes, if we can restrict the calories, if you can make them exercise, then this can ameliorate a decline in diastole dysfunction. A very important thing, this was uh, this came in JAG 2006. So the, the, the point is, uh, FF is an entity uh, every patient of diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, obesity should get an echo done. You have to dig out, try to phenotype them into phenogroup 1, 2, 3, get biomarkers, 
try to get a myocardial MRI, try to look at left ventricle GLS, try to look at left atrial strain and identify and subgroup these patients because you can prognosticate and treat them accordingly. That is the role we have to play. Thank you so much.